We are moving in a new direction, moving forward and moving beyond smoking. We are Altria, and our companies are leading the way in moving adult smokers away from cigarettes by taking action to transition millions toward potentially less harmful choices as we move from being known as a tobacco company to being recognized as a tobacco harm reduction company. Altria is moving beyond smoking. Find out how at Altria.com. Holidays are here, and so is fashionable fitness. Gift yourself a Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3 5G, a phone that folds in half to literally stand on its own. Pair it with the Galaxy Watch 4 for ultimate wellness and wow factor. Check health stats, flex personal records. Over 90 activities can be tracked, like biking, swimming, golfing, and more. Invest in yourself with tech made to crush goals. Holidays open up with Galaxy. Shop it all at Samsung.com. 5G connection and availability may vary. Check with Carrier. Products sold separately. Hey everyone, this is the Almost Rogue Podcast. Bringing to you mind blowing interviews with guests from all over the world. So settle down, relax, and enjoy the show. Oh yeah, by the way, if you like the podcast, please support Elmo's World Podcast on Patreon. Your support is what helps the podcast improve more and more. Welcome to Elmo's World Podcast. Uh, it's awesome to be here again and I have an interview with my friend the muslim theist you can find his uh, facebook page and uh, on facebook the muslim theist uh, hey bro can you uh, give us uh, in some information or tell us something about yourself yeah sure so um you know i uh, have a little facebook page uh, that's kind of i write sometimes and uh, a friend of mine actually sent me uh, one of your past interviews with tom jump and, uh, you know, I thought it was nice. So when you invited me on, I decided to say, why not? Why not? Let's have a conversation. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Being the Muslim theist, though, I think that you are willing to defend both Islam and theism because that's like the position you decided to take. I mean, uh, I don't like to, I don't like the, the framing of like, okay, I'm just here to defend a particular viewpoint. Like if I'm talking to someone and they make a good point, I'm willing to be like, okay, that's a good point. I haven't thought of, like, I have to think about that. I think too many people that kind of panic as soon as their worldview is challenged to like, you know, think, okay, I have to defend this. I have to, like, you can't evolve. And I don't have that perspective at all. My perspective is, uh, you know, we having a conversation, it's a give and a take. If I'm wrong about something, if there's something I don't know, then that's an opportunity for me to grow. And I'm not just going to, you know, uh, dial myself into a position from the get go right now. Okay. Thus far, the position, the worldview that makes the most sense to me is Islam as a worldview. I'm satisfied with it as compared to, uh, other worldviews that I'm observing. The other major competitor I view to be, uh, atheism. Uh, particularly scientific materialism, something like that. Um, but I think that worldviews uh, is inconsistent in many ways. Um, and so what I'm left with is theism, right? And out of those, then you kind of go through Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, the major theisms, and you kind of narrow it down from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, you said a lot of things like, uh, for example, you claim that uh, atheism is an inconsistent worldview, Okay, that that's something that uh, we have to look into. But one one other thing though, the process you explained is that you move from deism, then theism, then Islam, then this is where you that this is the position you've t taken. Am I right? Yeah, more or less. Okay. Well, I want to talk about um, the inconsistencies of atheism first because I think that w when you explain that, we, that can bring us to to the process of uh, or move into deism. So what? why do you think that atheism is an inconsistent worldview? 
So first of all, here's the thing. We have to um, distinguish between kind of an atheist ontology and an atheist epistemology. And obviously there's many different kinds of atheists, right? But one thing they t typically share in their epistemology is a skepticism, okay? Um, the first problem that I've consistently encountered with atheists is this, that they have a very particular high standard of skepticism, which they'll apply to theism because, uh, you know, they don't like it as a worldview. Right. Yeah. Let's say and I'm not saying they necessarily are just doing what they don't like, but they, they're arguing against that that worldview. So they're going to have a particular a very high uh, standard. Then as soon as you ask them about their beliefs. Right. So, uh, again, atheism doesn't necessarily entail a very a particular worldview, but um, in the sense that like you can be, I don't know, a, a libertarian or a communist or whatever, like there's many different shades. But you'll be like, OK, what what is your value system? For instance, okay, I, I believe in freedom. I believe in freedom of speech. I believe that, you know, we can have objective morality. I believe this. I believe that. And then you're asking them, okay, how is this consistent with you a second ago telling me that, well, maybe there could be, uh, uh, you know, logical contradictions uh, that exist in the world? Well, you know, quantum mechanics tells us that, you know, there's one interpretation in which, uh, you know, a contra uh, contradiction can exist. So I'm like, okay, so if you're applying that level of, of skepticism where you're telling me even basic laws of logic are open to question, where is it that you're getting off talking about morality and politics and this and you're talking about who to vote for and whatever? It's like, dude, you're telling me that the, the law of non-contradiction doesn't exist. So actually we should vote for both uh, Biden and Trump, right? Because apparently contradictions can exist, right? Uh, so there, there's no – that's this is one problem that, that I find with atheism is that – there is that lack of cons uh, consistency just in terms of how the dialogue is proceeding. They don't say, okay, now that I've accepted the premise that the law of non-contradiction is in question, what follows from that? And they don't realize the absurdity that follows from that and how you can just arbitrarily now pull out the, well, maybe logic doesn't work hard mm -hmm. on literally any debate at any time. Mm -hmm. And they're simply uh, like selectively doing it, right? And I'm not saying that atheists realize this, but uh, it is something that to point out. Mm -hmm. So that's one. The other is, okay, on the actual level of like, let's say ontology, right? So this is going to apply to a very particular kind of atheist, which is what, what you might call like a scientific materialist. Okay, so the methodological naturalism or naturalism in general. What you end up with is a lot of uh, problems with it. Okay, so for instance, you have the hard problem of consciousness. This is a direct mm -hmm. refutation of materialism. What materialists will normally say is, look, we, we know it looks bad, okay, that here we're saying everything is, is material, but then you have this one thing, which, by the way, is actually the most undeniable uh, thing, even if you take a skeptical methodology like Descartes, you're more justified in, like, denying the external world exists than denying your own consciousness, right? So, okay, we have this undeniable thing here, and it appears to be immaterial by all uh, accounts, because, for instance, material things... Uh, don't have certain properties, right? Like, for example, intentionality. Material things are not pointed, to, directed towards something. Consciousness is directed and pointed towards something. Just as an example, and there's many different pro properties that philosophers of mind will list. Okay, so we're looking at this, and matter and mind appear to have two totally different sets of properties. But you know what? Don't worry, we'll be able to explain this, you know, 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years from now, maybe. Right. That's, that's kind of the, the position they take. And to me, I'm like, OK, but working with the data you have now. Right. The rational position is to abandon materialism because it, it looks like an insoluble problem. So why would you put your entire worldview on a, on the on this cart? You know what I mean? Yeah. So th this is one of the other the other. There's more problems like, for example, Alvin Plantinga's argument about how. Uh, and by the way, I haven't flushed out the hard problem of consci consciousness as well as I, I should um, because once you get into like the nitty gritty details, you're going to see like all the different responses the atheists have and how none of them really, um, none of them really hold up. Um, and then you have the problem, you know, again, once again, there, it seems that, you know, like consistency needs to be key here. If you're going to tell me, okay, we have a, a theory, the theory of evolution, this is how, this is our story, this is our meta narrative. Okay, so if the theory of, no, of uh, evolution is true, then that would basically mean that you have no reason to believe that your mental faculties can actually arrive at the truth because they're designed simply to help you survive. And surviving and truth are two different things. If I think there's a pink elephant behind me and that causes me to dodge a tiger, 
then I have survived, but I was completely wrong. It wasn't a pink elephant be behind me. It was a tiger. But in both instances, I, you know, I ran out of the way, and so I'm saved. So likewise, we would have no reason to think any of our beliefs are actually truth-oriented. We would only have uh, the idea that our beliefs are uh, survival oriented and therefore your belief in naturalism itself, your belief in the theory of evolution itself is self-defeating, it's self-refuting. So those are just a couple of the problems. Okay, cool. But I guess then that it, to unpack that all, uh, you mean to say that in terms of the, the worldview of atheism, it has as many problems as in any theist worldview, is that am I correct? Especially on uh, the ontology, the consciousness, evolution, everything that they claim and hold to be, to be self -evident, evidently true are actually very hard to to produce and to be certain of, right? It's it's not merely that it's it's a consistency issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, yeah. it's simply that, yeah. like with theism, with theism, you can hammer out a fairly consistent worldview mm -hmm. okay okay in you terms can hammer of consistency. Out a consistent worldview yeah in terms of consistency yeah. for them though. they can't do that they'll they, they always have to switch their standard and they have to switch their discourse depending on what they're talking about their politics is not in line with their ethics their ethics is not in line with their ontology their ontology is not in line with their their epistemology yeah, I, I, with I theism you can you can get everything lined up Mm, from your epistemology it. down to your ethics and your politics but in terms but, of uh, in terms of like consistency you know um i think that there are a lot of atheists who ground their politics on a materialistic worldview especially and that for example when they t discuss ethics they take into account that there is no objective morality they take into account that there is no god and they take into account existentialism and nihilism and they, uh, they include this in their moral principle, principles. How, how would you uh, account for that? So look, there is a spectrum and there are atheists that are more consistent and there are atheists that are less consistent. Okay, okay. okay. But so, so there is a spectrum. But what I'm saying is ultimately, uh, like if you, if you uh, accept, for instance, that there is, uh, that all there is is matter, okay? And purpose is a mental property. Okay, it's a property mm -hmm. of consciousness and consciousness ultimately is just matter. Mm -hmm. What that means is there is no purpose. There is no objective yeah. purpose. So yeah. on what basis now are you coming to prescribe an ethics and implement it? Yeah. So in a way, um, I've discussed this on my debate with uh, John Anthony. Yeah. That when I said that um, atheism ultimately entails nihilism, it's sort it's, is that sort of what you're saying that um, in terms of what uh, what kind of purpose we can derive from from our from from a materialistic worldview it's purely subjective that and and so i'm saying something beyond that which is mm -hmm. this if i ask the atheist okay on what basis did you actually reject the existence of god and they told me well because in quantum mechanics it, it's possible that there's there can exist non-contradictions right mm -hmm. so once you now accepted that principle what i'm saying is okay you got to carry that over into now your discussion of politics. If it's possible that the principle of non-contradiction I is disagree. True, how are you even... I, I disagree. Why, why do you say that? Go because, ahead. you know, um, quantum, the quantum realm uh, works in differently logically in terms of of ha of that. And I, I think that a lot of theists also claim that the law of non-contradiction doesn't work the same way in in the quantum realm. So it, will, it would actually... It would, um, actually be the, the same for a theist. So I, don't, I see no difference. And I, I don't think that's a good argument, though. Uh, so so do you, are you saying that in, in the quantum realm, it also follows the three laws of logic? That, that it, it What works? I'm saying is, yeah, right now they have, and again, physics isn't my field, but as far as my understanding goes, they have different interpretations of the same data. Okay. okay, because there are there are limitations in terms of uh, the kinds of experiments they can do in quantum mechanics, because obviously you're dealing with something at such a small level that you have things like the measurement problem, which is whenever they're trying mm -hmm. to measure something, they affect the system they're trying to measure. And so therefore, uh, it becomes difficult to choose between competing theories because they're limited mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, their their ability to experiment. OK, mm -hmm. so if you have multiple competing interpretations, 
Mm -hmm. one of which implies that the law of con non-contradiction is false. Mm -hmm. And you have a dozen others that, do that don't require you to give up the law of non-contradiction. The logical thing to do, okay, the rational thing to do is to say the theory which implies that the law of non-contradiction is false is, is the wrong theory. It's one of the consistent theories, one of the well, theories that makes sense. That's the correct theory. That's a huge because as soon as you, claim, though. It's not really. It's not really because the, the entire scientific method is based on the law of non-contradiction. So whenever you do an experiment in science, you have two hypotheses, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And one has to be the logical negation. I, I disagree. Of the other. I disagree. That's, I don't think that's what the scientific method is. It's I mean, the scientific method doesn't hold any, any position on me, uh, metaphysics or ontology. It's just a process by which you can make sure w that what you hold, what the theories you make is actually, is plausible. You know, it, the models you work with are, are actually uh, uh, active, but it doesn't have any presuppos presupposed um, me um, metaphysics or, or rules, but, in, but yeah. I, I wasn't saying that. I, I wasn't saying the outcomes of science. I'm talking about the method itself. The method itself presupposes the law of non-contradiction. I disagree. So, though. I, I don't think so. Well, sure. We can we can look at the scientific method. It's to make a hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. That's step one. And then after that, there's a bunch of steps. I forgot it now because we learned it when I was in school. But basically, you design an experiment, then you have your observations, then you have your analysis, blah, blah, blah. So there's like seven steps or whatever, at least mm -hmm. the basic way that they teach it in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in school. And I'm saying at step one, formulating mm -hmm. a hypothesis, okay? That requires the law of non-contradiction because, and any, any scientist working in the field knows this, whenever you do an experiment and you design a hypothesis, you also mention you mentioned two hypotheses, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So the, the, the one will be a logical negation of the other. So like, for example, my hypothesis is that, you know, when I put this liquid into the beaker, it's going to turn yellow, for instance. The null hypothesis is going to be the opposite of that. Uh, it is the, is going to be, it is not the case that when I put this liquid in the beaker, it's going to turn yellow. Mm -hmm. You see, so one is it's going to turn yellow. The other is it is not the case that is going to turn yellow. One is a negation of the other. One is is a, the other is not a. You see, so yeah, because that's guess, what I they're guess, doing. I guess in 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 the in the process, but in terms of of observ observing and experimenting. I don't think that they would presuppose anything. I think that uh, a, 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 someone who actually uses the, the actual scientific method would only de uh, deem to be consistent with what they observe and whatever conclusions they derive from their observation, their data set. I think that's what they will use to formulate their theories and hypothesis, hypotheses. No, but what I'm saying is the very formulation of a hypothesis, hypothesis or theory requires the law of non-contradiction to make sense. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. That when they're formulating the, the hypothesis, when they're even doing the experiment, when they're reaching the conclusion, like how did we even get to quantum mechanics? If you're going to tell me, well, we can have theories that, that allow contradictions, why did we even give up Newtonian mechanics and go for uh, the theory of relativity? You could have just said, no, no, New New Newtonian mechanics is true. We just allow for contradictions, which means that when the light is bending around the thing and our equations doesn't make sense, well, we'll just say it's a contradiction. And now all of our theories work. Because as soon as you allow a contradiction in mathematics, you can prove anything. And so okay. every every formula that you can ever come up with for anything, uh, you know, you're 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 already set because you allowed for a contradiction. Mm -hmm. You okay. see what I'm saying? Okay. So once you allow that kink in the system, what I'm saying is it has massive reverberations, which you have to be cognizant of, you have to be aware of, and you have to uh, account for. And so, you know, at the very least, it's going to have massive effects on your epistemology and your metaphysics. And what I'm saying is that's inevitably going to kick down into your ethics. In a way, also, uh, I think what you're, you mean also is that any any theist who would hold that, that, that the law of non-contradiction doesn't work in the quantum realm would also be inconsistent if, if it, in their worldview, if in that case. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, well, other than that, I, um, it, I guess that uh, in terms of inconsistency I th or incoherence, I think it, it would be very, very uh, wrong to claim that, that any worldview 
is already coherent in itself because i think that coherence requires like uh an, a sort of omniscience or a totality of in, of inf- on the information it has uh, and and f- so far as we know we don't have that ca- we don't have omniscience we don't have a totality of under of of, under, of knowledge and so whatever model or worldview we, someone has it will always simply be dependent on the current information that we we have and so i don't think that there are any uh, coherent worldview right now what would you think uh, i think that you can have a coherent worldview given the data that you have available that's one so for example if we all know like let's say you know 20 letters of the alphabet a b c d all the way up to like q for example then there can be a consistent way of understanding a to q and there can be an inconsistent way of understanding a to q putting all the data pieces together as for the 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 you know six remaining letters of the alphabet or whatever uh you're right maybe one of those can contradicts the system but uh the point is that you're, you're you're working with what you have that's that's point one point two is that there are certain uh demonstrations for example that don't require uh, additional information. So for instance, no one's going to come and say, well, look, once we discover more about the universe, one plus one is going to equal five, right? One plus one is going to equal two. And so because of that, uh, you can kind of build uh, more secure beliefs versus some beliefs you're like, yeah, you know what, this is open to change. But some beliefs you're going to be like, no, no, this is pretty solid. I guess what you're saying is that deductive the deduction is as important as induction, I guess, especially in making a worldview. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you? Well, I I hope that you can start uh, building your foundations on uh, why you believe in God and how it led to Islam. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there's a uh, uh, personal side to it and just in terms of like, you know, uh, growing up and, you know, like I was a Muslim growing up in the West, right? And what I noticed was that there was a lot of things that, uh, you know, that as Muslims we believe that is in sharp uh, contra- uh, contrast with what society around me is believing and practicing. Right. And so that leads you at a young age to be like, okay, well, what's going on here? Like, who's right? Because some things you can kind of like fit, but then there's, you know, like if you're trying to fit something into a, like a round, uh, you know, what's a round peg into a square hole or whatever, a squ- or the opposite. Right. So eventually there's things that don't fit and that's going to lead you on a path of questioning. And I think a lot of young Muslims uh, face that path in the West, at least thinking Muslims. And so that's kind of where that, um, led me to. Now, again, I'm not coming on here to pretend like, uh, you know, I have researched every single issue and like, you know, I'm prepared to like write my, you know, 30 volume philosophical treatise in which I'm going to show, uh, you know, every, I'm, I'm saying this is where I've reached at this point with the research I've done is that yes, belief in God, uh, does make sense. Right. And the, the argument that I find most convincing is Ibn Sina's, uh, uh, contingency argument. So the basic idea of that argument is something like this, that you can have, uh, you know, a, a being is either going to be dependent on another for its existence, or it's not going to be dependent on another for its existence, right? So now we start off with the premise simply that something exists, just something. It could be my own mind. It could be just bundles of thoughts, whatever it is, whatever that thing is that exists. You ask of it, okay, is this thing that exists, is it going to be, is it, does it depend on something else or does it not depend on something else? If it depends on something else, then you say, okay, well, that thing, is it dependent or independent? Right. And so if it's dependent, then again, you ask that same question, is it dependent or independent? And so you kind of follow uh, a chain and what you want to get to is an independent foundation for the rest of, of reality. Right. And so when you get there, you're going to have basically a couple of options to try and get a worldview in which all you have are dependent beings. One is a circular dependency. A depends on B, B depends on A, um, which doesn't make sense because it implies either that like let's say a is depending on b and b is depending on a that implies that a depends on itself okay a depends on a um uh, which either is is incoherent because it means that a has to be prior to itself or it would mean something like a is actually just independent in which case what's the need for b 
right? So it would mean one of those two things. The other thing is that, okay, this chain keeps going and then you have, it terminates at a certain point and then you just have the first being that is dependent, but it just popped out of nowhere, okay? And this is like David Hume's scenario. And what I would say is that, okay, that first being that just popped out of nowhere, is it dependent or is it independent? If you tell me it's dependent, okay, then there has to be something by definition, there has to be something that it depends on. So it's a logical contradiction to say it just popped out of nowhere. An independent being can pop out of nowhere, no problem, right? But if you're going to tell me a dependent being, what you've said is in the definition, there has to be something else that is depending on it. Just, it doesn't just pop out of nowhere, you see? And then the third option is going to be an infinite regress. And again, I'm, I'm just going through this very quickly. Maybe there's some uh, you know, objections in your mind that you can that you can present. The third option is going to be basically that an infinite set of dependent beings. And at that point, what you'd ask is, okay, this entire set of dependent beings, is it itself dependent or independent? Uh, if it's independent, no problem. We move on to the next stage of the argument, which talks about the, the qualities of an independent being. And if it's dependent, then you ask, okay, what is it dependent on? If that thing itself is dependent, that's impossible because it has to be uh, part of that set because we just said the set of all dependent beings. Um, and so what you're left with basically in a nutshell is uh, you have to bottom out in an independent being. Do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with, the, uh, with like the contingency argument, but please go on. I'm, I'm all right with that. Right. So the last scenario, okay, so, you know, you have an and uh, the set of all dependent beings, this set is infinite. Um, it has to be dependent on, it, it's either it's independent, in which case we move on, or it's not dependent. Okay. So then the question becomes, okay, so you've gotten us to an independent being, but something that someone like Tom Jump might say is, okay, yeah, we have an independent being. It is uh, naturalistic pantheism, right? It's just the, uh, you know, matter at the end that's going to be, or some kind of energy or some kind of, whatever that's going to be at the bottom that's not God, okay? Um, now, the thing is, that's only going to work if you believe that consciousness is reducible to matter, okay? If you don't believe that consciousness is reducible to matter, meaning that consciousness is a fundamental property of reality, okay? Then you have to give an account for the origin of consciousness, an irreducible uh, account, I mean, a consciousness is not reducing into, into something. Consciousness has to be there at the foundation, you see, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to kick up, right? What is the, what is the ultimate, what is the consciousness is depending on ultimately, okay? Um, and so when you ch follow the chain of dependency, what you're going to get is that ultimately you're going to have to have consciousness dependent on uh, something which itself has consciousness. Otherwise, where, where does consciousness come from? It's just literally going to pop out of, no out of nowhere. Does that make sense? So that's basically how you get to a conscious uh, independent being. And then you also get that the independent being has to be one and not many, because if, for, for instance, you have many independent beings, then um, uh, the problem is that you ask, okay, so these many independent beings, okay, um, they have to be different than each other in some way. Because when I say that, for instance, there are, there are two books and not one book, uh, what that means is that the two books in some way differ, okay? Either they're going to be the same book, like the same title and everything, but in two different spatial locations, or they're going to be uh, one book, uh, sorry, two totally different books. Like, you know, one book is called, uh, you know, um, I don't know, you know, you know, the, the, the Quran, one is going to be the Bible, for instance, right? So those are two totally different books. The other could be like two copies of the Bible, but just in different spatial locations, like one is in my right hand, one is in my left hand. So uh, what you end up with is basically that when you're saying two, by definition, there has to be something different. And I'm not saying that something that has to be space or time. It could be, you know, whatever. Some string theories say that there's like 32 dimensions to reality. Maybe there's an infinite number of, uh, or a near infinite number of dimensions to reality. But I'm saying in some way, logically, there has to be a distinction between independent being A and independent being B. Okay, and so when you get there, you're like, okay, so uh, if there's some difference between them, that means you have parts because there's a part of them that's similar, which is causing them to both be independent beings. And there's a part of them that's different, which is the part where A becomes A and B becomes B. 
So once you have that, the problem is any hole is dependent on its parts. Okay, any hole is dependent on its parts. If I have a book, a book is going to be dependent on the pages, the the um, uh, and like the the cover and the form of a book for it to be called a book. Um, and so likewise, when I now have an independent being which has something similar to the other independent being, but something different which makes it A and not B. Uh, what you end up with is a, a composite, and a composite is always going to be dependent on its parts, and so therefore neither are going to be a true independent being. So if you have a true independent being, it's going to have to be perfectly simple, uh, by which I mean non-composite. Uh, some atheists, they make this memes about, oh, God is so simple or whatever, and I'm just like, you know what we mean by that. We mean not composite, not made of parts. That's it, you know? So uh, that's kind of a summary of it. Like, I guess that um, it, you believe that in absolute divine simplicity, I guess, similar to what the Platonics and, or Aristotle would claim. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of divine simplicity. Okay. Yeah, well, well I don't like it, but, but fine. Uh, then, um, Wait, you know, because it, it causes problems for Christians, that's why. <laughs> Once you accept <laughs> divine simplicity, you're like, okay, wait, how am I going to fit a trinity in here? Right. And so yeah. that's actually this argument is itself one of the reasons why I find Christianity hard to uh, have to hard to stomach. But the Ashari uh, would say differently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they can they can say differently and they have their arguments, but even they will say something like um, the, uh, you know, the that the the um, oh, what's a good translation for that? Like the 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 thing itself, like God himself is perfectly simple. Uh, but his attributes are not something, something along those lines. In other words, that you can have a perfectly simple being that has attributes, which are not parts of that being. They're simply like kind of added on attributes. Okay. Um, so th they have ways to kind of like try to explain that, um, you know, okay. which, which you can take up with them. Okay. Well, it, it, other than that, you know, I think that there are a lot of other arguments to prove that God exists, you know? So in a way, what you're doing is you, you use logic and induction and all of these, basically thinking about a metaphysics, and that's how you came upon your belief in God. Uh, more or less, yeah. Like I, I, what I gave here is basically like a summary version. But if I were talking to an atheist, he would challenge me on like seventy different points in that whole summary. And like I've I've done the back and forth where I'm like okay so what do you say about and then I go back and forth and work it down and what I found is that the only solution to the logical problem that I've presented is to say that there's an independent being and then the only the, the way that you get consciousness is very simple by by showing that materialism is is false and it's going to kick up the the problem of consciousness all the way back to the origin and you're going to get it from there um, and so once you once you put those two together. Uh, I find that that makes a, a perfectly coherent worldview. Okay, then let's talk about how uh, an absolutely divine, simple being uh, led you to Islam. Why would that? Why would that happen? Yeah. So look, when we talk about how you know, for instance, how do you know Islam is true? For instance, so how do we know anything at all? Right. There is basically three modes of knowing. Uh, that I can, uh, uh, you know, see and, and that many other epistemologists would agree with, um, which is intuition, uh, deduction, and induction, okay? So intuition is things that appear in your consciousness directly that you can directly grasp, for instance, your knowledge of your own thoughts. Uh, deduction is things that you kind of prove using logic, using deductive logic, and induction are things that you probabilistically determine to be uh, true and sometimes the probability builds up to such a point that like there's no way it could be false so for instance my knowledge of the existence of Siberia which I've never been to is based on induction and I'm 100% certain well, or 99.9999% certain that the whole world is not lying and that Siberia actually does exist so um, with Islam okay in the same way that for the existence of God you can have proof on those three levels so one way I know that God exists is through intuitive, through direct experience. The second is through deductive proof. And the third is through an inductive proof, meaning looking around me and determining that this world would have required a, a creator. Uh, similarly, we apply all three of those arguments to any religion. Okay. So you have at the, in, at the experiential level, okay, the experiential level, uh, do I feel a connection with a divine being, which I've now 
proven exists, right? I've now proven God exists. So does this religion now provide you with uh, an experience of that? Okay, if so, that is a very good confirmation. That's a good reason to believe that your religion, at least in some ways, at least in some way, I'm not saying it has to be 100% true, but there is a divine spark, you can say. There's something revealed about the religion that you're currently in. Okay. Um, the, uh, the second is deductively. So deductive proof can only get you so far, but the way Muslim theologians traditionally did this is they, they would say something like, okay, well, when we analyze the properties of the divine, we find that the divine has to be a have all of the perfections of existence. This is the way they put it, existential perfections, one of which is wisdom. Okay, And the, because God uh, is wise, he must have sent... Uh, you know, communication to human beings who are ignorant and do not know the full purpose of their creation. First of all, he must have created them with a purpose. And then second of all, he has to tell them what the purpose of their creation is. And so therefore, he must have sent some means to tell them what their purpose uh, in creation is. Part of that is going to be natural revelation. So what you find in your own self, in your own heart, Part of it is going to be what you observe in nature about the nature of, of uh, society in the in the universe and all of that. But there is a gap which which requires uh, messengers from God to come and tell us uh, what His will is and what our purpose in life is. Okay, uh, that's the second. And then the third way is going to be inductively. So this would be like looking at uh, the you know the claimants to prophecy or to divine revelation and to examine their life and to examine you know their doctrine and to therefore infer that uh, this person is, uh, you know, uh, a truthful or not. So that's basically a summary. Well, it's, I think that you, you've jumped a lot of there, especially when it comes to that on your, on your premises that because uh, God is wise and that humans are ignorant, then that he should have had like sent a revelation. That's a huge, uh, claim there and, and I, I it's not that I disagree but but how do you get there you know like oh, it, it's still it's not convincing though sure sure so what first I'm going to tell you personally what I I was just giving kind of a summary of the different ways not personally what I I find the most convincing so I'm going to I'm going to try to explain that in terms of what I find most convincing what I would say is this that look when most people, the reason why they believe in God, okay, or their particular religion, is because they do have a sense of the divine, okay? They do have a sense of the divine. When they pray, they feel that connection to something higher. Now, that being the case, if you're taking the position, like if you're starting off with the position of atheistic naturalism, right, or, or uh, scientific naturalism, whatever, you can easily just be like, oh, yeah, all these people are just delusional. Right. Like, uh, you know, there's no reason to think that people's beliefs have to map onto reality. There's no reason to think that our met mental faculties are anything more than the, uh, you know, the, the you know, uh, what's it called? The, you know, due to evolution, basically. Um, and it's all happening by chance. And so, yeah, you know, billions of people around the world are just delusional. Most of mankind in history has just been delusional. And now we're rational. And so we understand there's no reason to think this. But if I give you a deductive argument now showing that actually God does exist, or I give you a very strong inductive argument showing that God does exist. Now, when suddenly people are telling you, I feel a connection to God, you can't dismiss it because the prior probability that all these people are, uh, you know, deluded is massively uh, reduced. You now have a much, much higher pr prior probability that there is the communication coming from uh, the divine to mankind because the vast majority of mankind are, uh, you know, have the sense of it. Furthermore, automatically, once you've proven that God exists, the, uh, the probability that any religion is true goes up. I'm saying for all of them, the probability goes up compared to what it is when you have a, naturali a naturalistic scientific worldview. Because we already know that the object of their worship, what they're claiming to have gotten divine revelation from, is is actually there. And so uh, you end up getting this bolster for all religions across the board. So once you have that going, what you do is you now have to work from uh, from within the religions themselves. And so I think it is a a jump. Uh, like the, in terms of the questions you were asking me, it's like, okay, you went from God. How did you get to Islam? It's more specific than that. It's okay, you got God, how do you get to a religion? Or there's even any form of divine communication between God and man, 
Okay. And then that's going to apply equally to all religions. And then once you go there, then you go, okay, now that we've established that God even communicates to mankind or that there is this, this, this probability that this is happening, which the religion are you going to choose out of that? So I'm putting an intermediate step here. I'm not even going to Islam. I'm just talking about all religions now. If God exists, right, we have a much higher chance of saying that any given religion is true. Any claimant to prophecy, any claimant, anyone who's claiming to be a prophet is now automatically the probability has gone up, okay, compared to when we were in the agnostic or atheistic position. Does that make sense? Yeah, but but to me, though, it, there, there are a lot of, like, obstacles this type of argument has to overcome like for example um why 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 aren't we already in contact with god or why is is why why the hidden hiddenness you know and stuff like that why does he have to to use like a very very uh simple and hard way diff and difficult way in order to for me to for for his communication to 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 come to the people you know well, well, but why if he's um he if he's uh, all powerful then why this limitation so is this an argument against the existence of god or against god communicating to mankind uh, I, in again, some way? against the god communicating you know, because right. So because right. a lot of a lot of atheists would say that if God wanted to communicate, you know, He would have just, you know, d did that, and then okay, we communicated. But why? You know, it's sorry, you you cut off for a second. Could you repeat that? Yeah. So it, it was a sort of I guess it's sort of a special pleading I guess in in the case that um, God could have made a lot of other ways to communicate more efficiently, but he he chose uh a very simple man and that took a lot of uh, that went into process of a lot of blood and hardship and difficulty and was not able to actually reach the whole of humanity in in its in his attempt to reach them with to reach all people right so if we already established the existence of god right then uh, in response to that it's always possible to say look uh God has his own kind of purpose for that. But more specifically, you're actually going to have to look at the individual religions response to that. Okay. So every religion is going to have a different answer to that exact question you just asked. And that's actually going to help us determine which religion is true because it's going to have the more convincing uh, answer. Okay. To that question, okay. at okay. least partially, perhaps we can say that, look, God is, is infinite. We are finite. So we can't totally understand, but at least one that's giving a partial answer that satisfies the human okay. uh, soul. Okay. Is, going to, is going to help us determine that. I'm simply saying that as an atheist, you know, I would be comfortable totally dismissing all of mankind for all of history as being totally delusional based on my presuppositions. But once now I've accepted God exists and I've accepted that actually purpose is an inherent part of, of uh, creation and things like that, then I'm going to be looking around and being like, okay, so all of these billions of people who are claiming that, uh, you know, to have some sort of connection with God, all of these people are, are uh, lying. When I'm looking at the literature of saints, okay, when I'm looking at the literature of someone like, uh, you know, uh, a Rumi or a Hafiz or a, you know, um, uh, you know, whether even it, it be in other religions, right? Whether it be even in other religions, non-Islamic religions, there is very clearly here a uh, some weight to that. You know, inductively, I can't just dismiss it like I did when I was an atheist and be like, oh, all these people are just delusional because I know the object of their you know, the other side actually exists. If a communication is two ways, I've already established the other side it, it exists. And so when I'm looking at all these claimants to prophecy, I'm not going to automatically just be like, oh, they're, they're all totally lunatics and whatever. No, I'm going to give some weight and be like, wait, I have to take their claim seriously, at least the major world religions, because you would think if God is going to send a uh, revelation, it's going to have a major effect on the world. And so the major world religions, I would have to at least take somewhat uh, seriously. Um, and so what I would say is this, that the probability that all of these billions of people are delusional, right? Having the same delusion, not just delusional, but having the sa exact same delusion, delusion, right? That there is some sort of connection with the divine and they're de describing the divine in, in incredibly diverse environments with a lot of similarity. 
Yes, there's differences, but there's a lot of similarity. There are key features to the divine. They all are saying that the divine is infinite, that the divine is, uh, you know, ultimate goodness, ultimate love, ultimate whatever. Like, uh, they're describing their connection to the divine and this mystical journey that they're going through. For me, this is convincing that uh, that there's a general, let's say you can call it general revelation. There is a general communication to uh, to mankind. Okay. Well, I, I, let's talk about why why you think Islam has the best uh, communication or be, be, best text from God, or in a in a way. Right. Uh, the way I look at it is this: that in Islam, our worldview is actually not that the other religions are false. Okay, per se. In other words, we have no problem saying that in principle. Christianity is a revelation from God. Judaism is a revelation from God. Hinduism most likely was a revelation from God. Uh, Taoism, or at least some sort of Chinese spirituality, is a revelation from God. How do we know this? Because we have a verse in the Quran which tells us that God sent prophets to every nation. So every nation received the prophet, the Native Americans, the whatever. And so therefore, Islam is not in direct competition with these other religions. What the prophet uh, Muhammad wasallam is saying is that he is the last messenger. So he is the last in a line of messengers, all of which are teaching the same essential message. And the issues that we have with the other religions is not that they are totally false to begin with. I'm talking about the major world religions, typically. It's not that they are false like completely. It's that there are doctrinal issues. There are doctrinal, specific doctrinal issues. So for instance, with Christianity, we wouldn't say like, oh, Christianity is just totally false. We'd be like, this doctrine of the Trinity in the way that it has been understood and passed down, this specific thing is problematic. You see? So we're not throwing the whole thing out. We're not saying that the uh, spirituality that Christians experience that when they're praying to God, that God is just like, you know, has his back turned, you know, metaphorically speaking, and doesn't, uh, you know, uh, communicate and, and uh, you know, show his love and whatever to, uh, to all of, of uh, creation, including animals, right? What we're saying is that, no, these specific doctrines that you have ascribed to Jesus are problematic for the following reasons. Right, And that what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is doing is he's coming and kind of clearing uh, the air clearing the debris, let's say, that previous prophets when they came, uh, the, the doctrines, the political manipulations, the, all of the problems that occur in human society, all the things that have accumulated in these traditions, he's trying to come and give you the most pure, uh, unadulterated version of God's message, which is going to last us until the end of, uh, of time when Judgment Day comes. Uh, so we're not in competition with other religions. What we're saying is merely that we're the last in the line of true divine religions. And that worldview makes sense to me because I don't have to deny the the beauty of Christian mysticism. I don't have to deny the beauty that's found in, you know, the, the uh, Hindu ascetic tradition. I don't have to deny these things. What I simply say is that in this time period, okay, in the end times, the last communication from God has come and it has told us very clearly that it is obligatory on us to follow the Prophet Muhammad in this time period. And so if you're following a different tradition, you need to get on board with this one because this is the most updated me message. This is the most clean message. This is what the ship that's going to land us, uh, you know, keep us safe uh, in this, in, in the end times. Okay, cool. And then let's talk about whether or not Islam could have been true or the Prophet Muhammad could have been lying or a lunatic or actually telling the truth. Yeah, so I mean, I think the way I look at it is you look at the overall message, right? And you're getting a consistent worldview, right? You're getting a consistent general worldview. And for me, I see the wisdom as, as plain. And so this is something that I think is going to go back to people's individual research. One thing that I would warn, though, is that one thing that people try to do when measuring the truth or falsity of some of a prophet okay, or of a worldview is they compare it to moral truths they think to be true because of the environment that they grew up in. Okay, So, for example, the, the proposition that, oh, you know, well, uh, you know, obviously uh, gay marriage is okay. And so therefore, because the prophet Muhammad was saying that gay marriage is not okay, 
or, or even homosexuality, engaging in homosexual acts in general is not okay. Therefore, he's a false prophet. No, but you have to be like, okay, what is the basis for this moral worldview that I have? And you have to be able to substantiate your moral worldview for you to then use that as a measuring stick. So that's one thing that I, I would uh, warn against is there's a tendency to do that. And I think most objections actually to the prophet of Islam come from a liberal moral uh, worldview that people have internalized and they haven't in turn, uh, you know, critically examined it to see whether it's even consistent, whether or not uh, there are problems with it before then applying it. Okay, I, I understand in a way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, for example, like, how can I derive human rights in a, from a materialistic worldview? You know, it doesn't make sense and stuff. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, please go ahead and um, talk about the, the Quran and how it's actual, how it proves itself to be the word of God. Look, what I would say is this. You'll know the, uh, what's that saying of Jesus? You'll know them by their, or, or I don't know if it was Jesus or someone else in the Bible. You know, you shall know them by their fruits or, or uh, do you know what I'm, uh, can you, can you help me out here, Alma? Yeah, um, my, my sheep will hear uh, when I call to them and, and you will know them by their fruits, I think. You're right, you're right. All right, so, so you will know them by their fruits, right? So when you look at the Islamic tradition as a whole, now obviously you're talking about a, an entire civilization. And what I'm about to say does apply to other uh, religions as well. Okay, and I'm going to come back to that point. When you look at the tradition as a whole, yes, you find a lot of bad things which are natural to human beings because we, you know, as a Christian, you'll sympathize with our, our sinful nature and all of that. That's there. But you also find a majestic, mystical tradition within Islam. Okay, a majestic, a really serious mystical tradition to Islam. Okay, and uh, what I'm saying is when you look at that on the whole, okay, when you're looking at the revelation that, that the prophet is coming and you're seeing this mystical tradition and the fruits that it is born and them quoting the, the, the Quran. And I'm going to get to the Quran directly because obviously that is the greatest, uh, you know, that, that uh, shines well above any mystical work. But I'm saying when you look at the thing as a whole, you can be fairly confident that this is a serious religion that does lead a person to God. They do lead someone to have that connection with God. Okay. Now you might say, okay, well we have the Christian mystics. We have the Hindu mystics. We have this, we have that. And I would say, yes, I agree with you. But I already addressed this when I said that Islam is not in competition with those worldviews because our issues with those worldviews are simply on doctrinal matters. We don't deny that Christianity in principle is a divine revelation, right? So our issue is just saying, look, the Trinity is the problem here. It's not the whole thing. So we can allow for that entire Christian mystical tradition without, uh, you, you know, without a serious problem. And we would say, yeah, the reason why that mystical tradition exists in Christianity is because it is a true revelation that Jesus was, in fact, sent by God, and he taught the disciples, and he transferred that light that was in his heart to the disciples, and those disciples transferred it to those that they taught, who taught, taught who, who transferred it to, uh, of course, not everyone, but some of who, those who they taught, and eventually you have kind of a fading of the light as you, as you typically, not, not necessarily for each person, but you have a fading of that light as time kind of passes, right? until you get the, the revelation of Islam, which is going to stay strong, inshallah, God willing, to the, the day of judgment. So uh, that's what I would say to that. Specifically the Qur'an, right? Specifically the Qur'an. Again, for me, when I read it, I feel that, uh, that mystical intuition, okay? So we talked about three ways of knowing intuition, deduction, and induction. Uh, intuitively, I see the divine light in the text. I feel the divine light in the text. I see it with the eye of the heart, so to speak. So for me, this is a sufficient reason to be like, okay, yes, this is something that is uh, leading me to God. Obviously, inductively, there are also arguments. For instance, you look at some of the things that are mentioned in the Quran in terms of uh, scientific foreknowledge. So this is like science, obviously, is, you have certain scientific uh, in, uh, inferences and certain scientific theories that are uh, more speculative. When you look at some of the certain scientific knowledge that we've discovered, or the more certain scientific knowledge we've discovered, you find some of that uh, foreshadowed um, in the Quran, for instance. And so that, that's a good inductive argument to be like, okay, this is divine foreknowledge. And obviously, 
uh, on each of these points, there are going to be people who who would want to challenge that and you know then go into the details. And for some of these arguments, not all of them, for some of them, I've really gone into the details to see, okay, what is their argument? And what I would say is this, when it comes to scientific foreknowledge is this, that the nature of the Arabic language and the nature of a text like the Quran is that it allows for multiple interpretations, okay? If even one of the interpretations, and by the way, when I mean multiple interpretations, I mean interpretations which can, which can plausibly be derived from the language of the text. I don't mean just being like, oh, well, this word over here, uh, you know, like superimposing that is, oh, it's just some metaphor for blah, 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 and just kind of flying up in the air. I'm saying, no, the actual grammar of the text, when you read it, the grammar of the text allows for multiple interpretations. The, the meaning of the words in the text allows for multiple interpretations, which have historically been used in the Arabic language. When you sit down and do that, if even one interpretation leads you to scientific foreknowledge, then that is uh, counts in your favor. Why? Because there are an infinite number of, of sentences which could have been false. And so if you have one sentence, which even one interpretation of which gives you a true scientific foreknowledge, then that counts as, as good evidence. On the other hand, some people try to apply the same, be like, oh, well, you have to apply the same standard. And so if you have something that is scientifically false, right, then, then that should be, uh, uh, you should look at the Quran as well in that light. And what I would say is yes, but if you have a single interpretation of the Quran, which, it, which would allow you to avoid a, uh, a certain scientific knowledge that, like a scientific knowledge of which we're certain uh, with the text of the Quran, then that doesn't count as a refutation. So in other words, I, I'm, I'm applying a double standard, but it does make sense to apply that double standard. And the reason is because you have an infinite number of sentences which could be false scientific knowledge and a very, very limited set of sentences which can be certain scientific knowledge. And so the chances of getting something completely wrong are much higher than the chances of getting anything right. And so when you analyze the text, and this is a problem that I found a, a, a lot of atheists who try to argue against the Qur'an scientifically, what they do is they, they try to argue that the most quote-unquote plausible interpretation con contradicts with science. That's not good enough because, uh, because that depends on, on what you're reading into the text. As an atheist, you already think it's false, and so you're going to come and tell me this is the most pl plausible interpretation. Me as a, as a Muslim, I'm going to tell you no, the most plausible interpretation is the one that doesn't conflict with other certain knowledge that we have, right? Um, not just what you think is most evident from the text. And so what you do is you, you do that matching process. You look at, you take a scientific theory, you weigh its strength, and then you look at the Quran and you look at all the possible interpretations that you can linguistically derive. And if the Quran is just man-made, it should be very easy for them to find something which no matter how you read it grammatically is going to be false. It's false on its face. There's no way around it. It's done. They should be able to do that. They can't. It's very difficult. They can't do it. But the other way where we find even a single interpretation which would be true, we have dozens of those. So when you look at that uh, both ways, you're looking, okay, so the, the weight of the evidence is in the uh, is, is in favor of the Qur'an. Yeah, that was a, a lot to break down, but yeah, I, actually, I, I myself have read the Qur'an and I've seen the, the consistencies, especially in, in the miracles that it claims. You know, it, some of them actually you surprised me a lot. Like, uh, how, how have I never learned about this? And if you look at also, have you concerned, have you, uh, are you familiar with the, the mathematical uh, miracles of the Qur'an? Like, how, how, the, its symmetry and how many times the word is repeated and, it, and there, the, and it assumes like, for example, like lunar cycles and stuff. I've seen some of that. Some of it I think is more convincing. Some of it less convincing. Okay. Uh, like some of it I think is a bit of a reach, but some of it uh, is, is uh, you know, really uh, striking, let's let's say. Okay. Yeah. And But I think that, um, you know, when it comes to consistency, when you claim that you have deductive consistency, uh, for me, that would require some sort of certainty in all parts of your of your argument, especially if you're going to claim a, a religion, uh, um, uh, your your belief in your religion, on 
all, on multiple syllogisms uh, relying on on top of one another but in a way i i, I see i see your point that um in, in terms of how we lo- look at the grand scheme of things and consider every category of of knowledge that we we can have it all it all indicates that we have a creator i would agree with that but in terms of i guess like uh the quran the quran itself is law you know it I, I I'm still on the fence about it, but I wouldn't deny it or dismiss it. I dismiss it. That's why I'm I'm still on I'm on my path of memorizing the Quran Quran myself in Arabic. But yeah, um, and um, I hope that it it's been a great uh, conversation for you, man, because I you've talked most of the time, and I just love listening to my guests. You know, especially we're on the roll, we're on them, they're on their the roll or something. And it's been uh an hour now. And can I give you one last question to end this interview? Uh, sure, but would you mind if I just commented on some of the things you said there? Okay. Uh, um, in terms of having deductive, I don't mean that you can provide a deductively, uh, like a, a just based on deduction and something like the premise that something exists, right? That you mm-hmm. can prove everything. What I'm saying is that's enough to get you to God. Okay, mm-hmm. I believe that you can have a deductive argument for God. Mm-hmm. Um uh, perfectly, really, the, the something that the only empirical, quote unquote, empirical premise that you require is that something exists, which is really an intuitive premise, not an empirical one. Mm-hmm. But th- the rest of it, at some stages, you are employing inductive reasoning, you are employing intuitive reasoning. I'm not denying that. Um, I'm simply saying that at no point did I say, for example, that uh, did did something that I required, for example, to prove God exists, come bite me in the butt later when I'm talking about ethics, for instance. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm trying to say? Whereas with the atheists, what they're doing is they're switching back and forth depending on the level of of the discourse. Yeah. Uh, For me, I have a a consistent system in that way, where nothing in the beginning contradicts anything at the end and vice versa. I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first. The second, I apologize if I was talking too much. You could have interrupted it's okay. me. I would have been it's happy okay. to stop. But I, I never but interrupt. You seem to be nodding guests. along, so I was just kind of like, okay. I, I find as a rule that I never interrupt my guests when they love talking. You know, it, it's it's a it's a it's an experience that I some would call life changing, actually. Or, or <laughs> yeah. No, but, I enjoy the back and forth. Yeah, yeah, you can interrupt me if there's ever future interviews. You can feel free to interrupt me and press okay. me on a point, and we can go back and forth. Okay, and one last question, bro. Um, you know, sure. I, I, it seems that you are you have this message to all them atheists who are inconsistent, inconsistent in their worldviews. What would be your, I guess, your message to them in that how they can analyze their position and look to themselves whether or not w- what they state politically actually matches the other parts of their belief system. Yeah, I guess what I would say is that you have to think about how, you, you know, when it comes to your epistemology, when you're coming to be skeptical about another person's worldview, what exactly did you say to refute their worldview? Yeah. What exactly did you say? What exactly, how did you challenge their premises? And then look at your own line of reasoning to get to where you got to and see whether or not you, you didn't apply that same standard to your own world. Exactly. Uh, that's exactly. very important. Okay. And, and that's, that's kind of, I hope I've done that uh, here, perhaps some atheists at some point, because I was kind of quickly summarizing many different. You still there, my bro? Right. I was simply saying to uh, compare that with what they're using to refute other worldviews or deny other worldviews to see if they're applying that consistently to their own reasoning when they're reasoning about their own worldview. Mm-hmm. And what I, what I also said is that because I summarized, let's say, a lot of arguments here, I didn't really go in depth. There are many people watching who probably thought that they found a flaw or massive gaps in the reasoning that I was presenting. And I would invite them to message me on my Facebook page, The Muslim Theist, and you know we can have a conversation about it. If they thought anything I said didn't make sense or was weak or they'd like to have a conversation about it, uh, they can feel free to do so. Awesome. Well, uh, bro, thank you so much for your time and it's been awesome. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the end of it. Thanks for tuning in, guys. This is your host, Elmo Ador Jr. And thank you for listening in and please subscribe. Please follow us on Facebook. Please, please follow this. Please. Thanks. Thanks. 
With unlimited free delivery, a Walmart Plus membership helps with whatever life throws your way. And the holidays throw a lot. Like when you make a gift list, check it twice, but still forget someone. Or when you plan a dinner for four, but 14 show up. Or when you turn away for two seconds and your dog eats the turkey. Bad boy, Dino! Walmart Plus saves the holidays with unlimited free delivery on fresh groceries and more at everyday low prices. Start your free trial membership at walmartplus.com. $35 order minimum restrictions apply. See membership details. We're moving in a new direction. Moving forward and moving beyond smoking. We are Altria. And our companies are leading the way in moving adult smokers away from cigarettes by taking action to transition millions toward potentially less harmful choices as we move from being known as a tobacco company to being recognized as a tobacco harm reduction company. Altria is moving beyond smoking. Find out how at Altria.com.